Welcome to section 12 of Reproductive Embryology. In the last video, we discussed normal genital development, and in this video, we'll discuss the pathology associated with these processes. Let's get started. Here is an overview slide of the topics we'll be covering throughout this lecture. Let's begin with malarian agenesis. Malarian agenesis is also known as mayer rokitansky custer hauser syndrome. This is due to hypoplasia or agenesis of the paramesonephric duct, which as you'll recall is also known as the malarian duct, hence the name malarian agenesis. And as we've just learned, the malarian duct is responsible for the development of the female internal genitalia. So it's logical that if this is defective, then the internal genitalia would also be defective, including the vagina and uterus. The exact reasoning behind why this occurs is not well understood. These patients are phenotypically female with the genetic sex of XX. However, they have an absent or defective uterus and as a result will often first present with primary amenorrhea. This makes sense, right? The patient doesn't have a uterus, so no endometrial shedding will occur and the patient will not have a menstrual cycle. Another key feature is that these patients have fully developed secondary sexual characteristics, such as breast development. This is because the ovaries are present, so estrogen is produced, and these characteristics are still developed. From this image, we can see that if the paramesonephric duct, or malarian duct, does not form properly, then the patient will lack a uterus and a vagina. All right, so this disorder deals with complete agenesis of the paramesonephric ducts. Sometimes the paramesonephric ducts are present, they just don't develop properly. If this happens, then the patient can develop uterine anomalies, which we'll discuss now. There are three uterine anomalies you need to be familiar with for step one, including a septate uterus, a bicornuate uterus, and a uterus didelphus. A septate uterus is due to failed resorption of the septum between the fused paramesonephric ducts. From this image, we can see that initially, the paramesonephric ducts are separated from one another. So there's one on the left and one on the right. However, in the second image, right here, we can see that they fuse together towards the bottom, right here. A septum is initially formed between the two ducts, which is eventually obliterated. If this process fails to occur, then the patient will have a persistent septum within the endometrial cavity, and this is known as a septate uterus. So these patients will have an indented endometrial cavity with a smooth fundus. I'll show a picture of this in a second. Also, all these anomalies will have an increased risk of pregnancy complications, such as ectopic pregnancy, preterm birth, and so forth. And this should make logical sense to you, right? After all, if there are problems with the uterus, then it should make sense that a fetus would have a more difficult time growing and staying healthy. Finally, a septate uterus can be treated with septoplasty, which also should make sense. There's a septum, so let's surgically remove it. This is an image of a normal uterus along with three uterine anomalies. Notice that in a septate uterus, the endometrial cavity is indented, which you can see right here. However, the top part of the uterus, right here, is known as the fundus, and it's unaffected, so we still see that nice rounding at the top of the uterus. The next uterine anomaly is a bicornuate uterus. This is due to incomplete fusion of the paramesonephric ducts. This results in an indented fundus with a normal cervix and vagina. Also, the uterine horns may be completely, partially, or only minimally separated. Finally, just like with the other uterine anomalies, there is an increased risk of pregnancy complications. From this image, we can see that a bicornuate uterus is similar to a septate uterus, but notice that the fundus is also indented, which you can see right here. The last uterine anomaly is the uterus didelphus. This is due to complete failure of the paramesonephric ducts to fuse, and it presents with a double vagina, cervix, and uterus. Pregnancy is still possible despite this anomaly. It just carries additional risks with it, just like with the other two anomalies. From this image, we can see that a uterus didelphus has a double uterus, cervix, and vagina. So far, we've discussed malarian agenesis and uterine anomalies. Now we'll discuss MIF-related disorders. MIF-related disorders, or malarian inhibitory factor-related disorders, all share a similar mechanism. Malarian inhibitory factor is decreased, and this results in persistence of the internal female genitalia. If we go back to the overview diagram that we introduced in the last video, recall that Sertoli cells normally secrete MIF, and as you can see, this inhibits the malarian duct from forming. Therefore, if the Sertoli cells are absent, this would cause decreased MIF. Alternatively, MIF can be defective or lacking, or the gene for MIF could be defective. Any of these scenarios would result in decreased MIF, which would result in the persistence of the malarian duct. And if we follow this diagram, you can see that if the malarian duct develops, then the internal female genitalia will also develop. Recall from this image that the paramesonephric duct, or malarian duct, 
is responsible for the formation of the internal female genitalia. These individuals have a karyotype of 46XY and are phenotypically male. There are three causes, including an absence of Sertoli cells, a lack of malarian inhibitory factor, and persistent malarian duct syndrome. A super rare but high yield disorder to focus on is persistent malarian duct syndrome. This is due to a defect in the anti-malarian hormone gene and predictably results in persistence of female internal genitalia. However, it also commonly presents with undescended testes and an inguinal hernia. So if you see this triad, undescended testes, and inguinal hernia, and the presence of internal female genitalia, you're dealing with persistent malarian duct syndrome. All right, now let's move on to discuss 5-alpha reductase deficiency. If we go back to the overview diagram, we can see that 5-alpha reductase is the enzyme that converts testosterone to DHT, which is the more potent form of testosterone and is important for the development of external male genitalia. We introduced this figure in the last video as well, and you can see that DHT is important for the development of the external male genitalia listed on the right side over here. So 5-alpha reductase converts testosterone to DHT, and it's necessary for the development of the external male genitalia. If there is a deficiency, then individuals will be unable to initially develop the external male genitalia. The karyotype is typically 46XY, and patients will have normal internal male genitalia such as the vas deferens and epididymis. However, the patient will have external female genitalia at birth, so they will look like a girl. Oftentimes, the genitalia may be ambiguous, meaning there may be an enlarged clitoris or labia. However, these children are often undiagnosed and are initially raised as females. At puberty, the testosterone levels rise, resulting in the development of normal male genitalia. Okay, let's finish up by discussing congenital penile abnormalities. There are two abnormalities, epispadius and hypospadius. Epispadius occurs when the genital tubercle migrates abnormally, which results in an opening of the urethra on the dorsal surface or top part of the penis. You can remember where the opening is with epispadius by remembering that the dorsal opening would result in P in your eye. All of the letter E's should make you think of epispadius, and the ping in your eye part of this mnemonic should make you think of ping upward. So the defect is on the top part of the penis. Finally, epispadius is associated with increased incidence of bladder extrophy, which also has the letter E in the word. And this is a rare condition where the bladder is exposed to the skin through an opening in the abdomen. Hypospadius is the last condition we'll discuss. This is more common than epispadius, and it results from a failure of the urethral folds to fuse on the ventral surface of the penis. This results in an opening on the bottom of the penis. It's associated with inguinal hernias, cryptorchidism, and cordy, which is upward or downward bending of the penis. Here's an image of hypospadius and epispadius. Like we mentioned in hypospadius, the urethra opens on the bottom surface of the penis, so right here. And in epispadius, it opens on the top part of the penis, so right here. All right, now that we've covered the information, let's review with a question. A newborn girl is found to have an enlarged clitoris, but is otherwise normal. Her parents are concerned and decide to do genetic testing, which reveals that the karyotype of their child is 46XY. Further investigation reveals that this child's condition is due to an enzyme deficiency that normally produces a more potent form of testosterone. An abdominal ultrasound of the child will most likely reveal which type of genitalia. Okay, from the question we learn that this child has an enlarged clitoris, a karyotype of 46XY, and an enzyme deficiency that normally produces a more potent form of testosterone. Collectively, these clues should make you think of 5-alpha reductase deficiency. In this condition, a lack of testosterone during fetal development results in failure to adequately form the external male genitalia. However, the internal male genitalia form just fine. Therefore, an abdominal ultrasound will most likely reveal internal male genitalia. From this diagram, recall that 5-alpha reductase normally converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, and that this is responsible for the development of the external male genitalia. Therefore, if it's deficient, then the external male genitalia will not be formed at birth. However, at puberty, testosterone levels will rise, and then they will develop. So if we go back to the question, the answer again is that the internal male genitalia will most likely be revealed on abdominal ultrasound. And with that, we've covered everything you need to know about the pathology of genital development.